the, the first advice I would say is be extremely clear about what your purpose is. I came into the world being extremely clear about what not only my goal, but my purpose as a leader in what I was, was here to do. And I think it's important for all HR professionals to understand really what are the critical business needs for the organization that you're part of and what is your role and your purpose within that. Don't conduct your analysis in isolation because data is so incredibly powerful. Not defending just the tribe, but defending the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. A good experience pays dividends down the line. Stereotypes tend to break down in proximity. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. Hey everyone, welcome to We're Only Human. I'm really glad to have you here with us. And I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time. So I was telling our guests before we started recording, Alex Smith, she's the CHRO for the city of Memphis. And she has this tremendous background in leading HR for a very strategic level. And so I'm excited to talk to her about some of the things she's done, some of the experiences, and also some of the lessons she's learned so that we can all hopefully level up our own experience as HR leaders across the board. So Alex, welcome. So glad to have you. Hi, Ben. How are you? Goodness, it is a wonderful day, and I'm really glad to have you here. How about you? Absolutely. It's wonderful to be here. Awesome. So before we dive into some of the fun things, would you take a minute or two and tell the audience a little bit more about who you are and what your experience is, what you do today? Absolutely. My name is Alex Smith. I'm Chief HR Officer for the City of Memphis. The City of Memphis as an employer is around 8,300 employees, but as a city entity or municipality, it's around 650,000 residents that we serve. A part of our work in Meadow Municipality is that we have about two-thirds police and fire. And so leading the HR division for the city, our focus is really on helping those who help others, especially helping others in their time of crisis. And so our focus uh, in this work is, is all about uh, the care and feeding of employees and really demonstrating what HR can do with the public sector space. From a background perspective, I am truly a bread and butter HR person. Uh, I uh, have my bachelor's in economics, my master's in human resources from University of Minnesota. And I started off my career actually in high tech, working for Microsoft, and then moved on to other big companies. And just have had a pleasure working in, in different capacities. I worked in over six different industries, facilitate HR in a number of different environments. And it's interesting that there are similarities and there's, of course, differences as well. But at the core of it, it really is about helping other people and helping the business be successful. That's what I love the most. Well, that's, it's interesting to hear this varied background that leads you into this kind of public sector role, because I'll be honest, right? You may, I don't know if you disagree with this, but I'd, so I'd love to hear. But when I think of someone who's very forward thinking, very innovative, very strategic from an HR perspective, you don't imagine that person is going to select a role like that for their career opportunities. You see them going to one of the technology companies or to some other organization that's really leading the space. Why did you pick that? And what do you think it takes to really exemplify that kind of leadership in that type of industry or environment? As most people, it all starts when you're in kindergarten. <laughs> and, and, and for me, the journey to public sector actually started when I was very young. So I, I come from a family that is committed to public service and it served in a number of different roles in my local town. And so growing up as a, a little girl, I saw that, that you could have really the best of both worlds of being a business leader and serving in a, a number of capacities in, the, in public service. And so I knew that one day I would want to, to do this. And even along my journey, I served in student government. I served in a number of different volunteer committees, uh, was a resident assistant, all those things where I always felt it was important to contribute and give back to the community that I was a part of. So for me, this was a opportunity of a lifetime of being able to go into worlds, which is my knowledge and love for HR as a profession with actual service and being able to help. And I think we've had a number of, of years of success over the last six years because it really is a blend of serving others and serving the public. Uh, and demonstrating what can be done in terms of how you hire, develop, 
uh, and mature talent to be able to be able to do the best things for the citizens. Really intriguing. Right. Most of the HR leaders I know, they lean towards the service aspect. They see this as a profession of service broadly. We're taking care of people. We're serving them. We're serving the organization for sure. We're taking care of people at the end of the day and whatever, whatever we can do to make sure they're most capable and ready to serve our customers, all those kind of things. And yet you're, you're all wearing this kind of dual hat of, yes, I'm serving them, but I'm also have the chance, have the opportunity, have the privilege of serving for my public capacity. I haven't, I haven't looked at it like that. So I think that's really unique as perspective. I really, that's, I think a theme. So one of the things you mentioned earlier is this broad variety of, of roles that fall under the, the purview of the city from an administrative standpoint in terms of the jobs and the, the types of tasks and the things that needs to get done. And I'm just curious from you, because I've never worked in a, any sort of organization that had that broad of a set of opportunities to do jobs. Does that variety make your job harder or does that make it more interesting and exciting because there's a lot of variety? I'm curious. I'd say, so it's both, right? So on one hand, it is, it is even the, even something as simple as FLSA, Fair Labor Standards Act. Well, the rules for FLSA are actually a little bit different for fire than it is for police. And then of course, we're thinking about this mixed population of we have office workers, we have field workers and, and everyone in between. And then we also have labor associations. So it, there is this variability that's there that brings a, a level of complexity. However, people are people. And so everyone has the core set of needs in terms of, am I getting my paycheck? Am I getting paid accurately? Does my health insurance work? Am I getting service? Uh, are managers able to hire quality talent they need with the time frame they need it? And those are universal things that no matter what organization you work for and really what size, those are all things that are true. So there are some things about our organization that I would say are very much so universal. And when I talk to HR leaders, whether they're in Hong Kong or in Silicon Valley or here in Memphis, we all are facing the same challenges of attracting and retaining talent. And that's fundamental. Where it's different, the nuances, if you will, around the industry. So the law enforcement in particular has some interesting components that and everything from being certified by the state to be able to actually proceed in that profession to all of this, I'll call it the social and civil concerns that have come up recently, especially upon the, the murder of George Floyd, related to how law enforcement is done within the city. And our role has to deal with and having to not only work, work with the labor associations, but to work with the employees, work with the leaders, and then even be able to communicate to the city council, which is like our board of directors, but they're elected officials, and having to talk with them about what we're doing and why we're doing. So there is that level of complexity. I, I would say it's absolutely fun, and especially the team that we've built over the last few years, everyone is super smart, super committed, passionate, and we have created a team culture that allows for us to really be adaptable, flexible, and nimble in dealing with a number of these issues. Goodness, I was going to ask you a follow-up, and you might have just answered it with that, that last sentence, but when you mentioned you'd been building a team, I was going to ask you, what's one of the qualities you look for when you're bringing someone into your team, if you want them to have the same kind of values, that, that the things that your team finds important and holds dear, how do you select that person? What do you look for? So I would say from a leadership standpoint, I've narrowed it down to two main qualities and I call it, are you humble and are you hungry? And those two core qualities I have found to be the most important, in particularly working in public sector. So humbleness is important because you're in an environment where you have limited resources, you have people who may have been there a long time that have certain ways of how they're looking at things. And so your ability to be able to share knowledge, but also gain knowledge from others that may know more than you or just have more experience than you, your ability to be able to teach others, your ability to be able to recognize the, if you will, the, the vastness of serving as a public servant, because we're all public servants first, that, that humbleness is really important for you to be effective and be able to work well with others. The, the hunger part is because of the resource constraints, you have to be extremely innovative and have a spirit of perseverance to be successful in our environment. It's not similar to private sector entities where you can just ask for a headcount or just write a check and it's solved. 
you literally have to think about, okay, what are other ways that we can accomplish this? What are partnerships? What are ways that we can improve our processes? And you constantly have to be thinking about innovative approaches to how to get things done. And so that requires a level of hunger and perseverance that you may not necessarily see in other places. So I look for people that have those two qualities first and foremost. And then from there, of course, subject matter expertise, depending on the role that we're looking for. It helps to know what you're doing, but if you don't have the other two, it's really hard to teach someone that doesn't want to be taught. No. And we literally brought in people come from really big companies, have all the subject matter expertise, but they don't have that humbleness. They don't have that hunger it, and they're not able to be successful. So those are two very core foundational qualities that are important or competency that are really What's interesting is the only the person I've interviewed in the last year that is in the public sector, there's Joanne Peter Searcy with the FBI and he's in their town acquisition team. And one of the things he said was very similar to that. He said, we are taking more risks on hiring someone who doesn't check all the boxes. If they have some of those things like you're talking about, those weren't his words on the hungry and humble, but he said, we're willing to risk hiring someone amazing rather than trying to find the absolute perfect candidate because we know they don't exist. So that's really intriguing to hear that again, because most people listening would assume that you're going to be more traditional, more stuck to these specific requirements and things like that. And to hear that gives me hope that those industries or public service as its own industry, sort of industry has the option of being more innovative if you're bringing more people into it and drawing them in with those kinds of uh, mindsets. So that's exciting to hear. Absolutely. And I would say, particularly in this time where it's so competitive for talent right now, I think we are willing to experiment and try certain things that other organizations may not be willing to. So for example, we've expanded the opportunity use program where we're uh, looking at helping to provide our um, work opportunity, but even education opportunities to those who are underemployed or hard to employ and second chance, et cetera. I think we recognize that there's this opportunity for inclusiveness and um, being open to being able to uh, share and provide opportunities to those who may not necessarily traditionally get access, but at the same time, but have the commitment and passion and really want to do the job. And so we can, you know, really use that as a foundation and then teach the other technical components. Mm -hmm. Excellent. What, one of the things that I saw when I was looking at your bio, the, the phrase, what does that mean to you? People first means that you understand and recognize that your strategy as an HR professional leads with people first in mind. So what that means is when we're trying to solve a business problem, the first thing that I'm thinking about is what is the impact for the people in the organization? Whether that's we need to think about different leadership, we need to hire a certain type of talent, we need to train talent in a different way, we need to think about discipline in a certain way, we need to think about reshaping the organization to be able to set people up for success. It's really having that, that I as a trusted advisor to your senior leaders, that you're helping them think about the people issues that they don't naturally think about every day. Because they're worried about making widgets or delivering a service. There's so many people implications related to that, that you really can bring that forward and help them to be even more successful uh, than what they originally even planned for because you helped them set the organization up for success. That doesn't surprise me to hear it coming from you, but it, that is a novel sort of concept for people to say, hey, wait a minute, the, the people aren't in the way of us delivering that product, delivering that service. The people are the method of delivering that product and that service. They're the enablers of that. And so if we put them first, then that's going to take care of itself. I've never heard someone put it that way though. So I think that's really, that's a powerful sort of lens or perspective to put on it for leaders when you're, for those out there. I think that leads us into one of the questions I wanted to throw at you is, how can the leaders listening into this right now, the other HR professionals that are, they want to be out and they grow up, right? They want to have your level of success and your little impact. What advice would you give them on how to create more credibility in the function or how to be more strategic as a leader? Because again, I've seen some of the, the pro and the con of the work you do is it's on a public stage. And so there's lots of stories about what's happening in the city and how it ties back to the human capital planning and things like that. So we have the benefit of looking in on your work. Other people don't probably don't have that same visibility into their job, but I feel like they still have the opportunity to do some of the things that you've done from a credibility and a strategic perspective. So what insights would you share there? The, the first advice I would say is be extremely clear about what your purpose. I recognize and, and in the the mayor and I, you know, 
when we were going through the interview process, were really clear that his intention in hiring was about helping him attract and retain talent for this discipline. So I came into the role being extremely clear about what not only my goal, but my purpose as a leader in what I was, was here to do. And I think it's important for all HR professionals to understand really what are the critical business needs for the organization that you're part of and what is your role and your purpose within that. Having that clarity up front really helps you to devise a strategy, partnerships, teams, tactics, and everything else that goes along with that so that you can really, truly live out your purpose, whatever that may be. I think secondly, having a commitment to to learning, and that's both learning from others, learning uh, from the profession, learning best practices, and being willing to be adaptable and flexible as things change. We all know that COVID has been the great equalizer in terms of HR professionals because we literally all were faced with something that none of us had ever been faced with before in our careers, everyone. So I talked to HR professionals who had been in HR for 50 years and people who had been in HR two years. And we all were like, we have no idea what we're doing. And we're trying to figure it out. And so the ability to learn and to, and once again, I think be humble and, and to also have this, this opportunity really to be vulnerable, even with your own teams to say, Hey, I'm learning this and I don't have all the answers. Let's co-create some of the answers together. All of that, I think is important. I go back to understanding your purpose, being truly a, a lifelong teacher and learner. And then I think lastly, really being willing to share your best practices with others. One of the things that we did during COVID is that we had calls with other HR leaders and shared with them what we were learning and gave a platform for us to share best practices. I think that was very helpful too in being able to once again continue with our success. That that process of, I think, continuous improvement and being committed to com- continuous improvement and helping the leaders to understand the role that people play in whatever they're trying to accomplish all of that together, I think, makes a difference in being successful in HR. That was a masterclass in itself right there. If we just <laughs> snip that piece of it and just share that one, that would be its own kind of standalone lesson on how to be great in this. I want to ask you a follow-up, though. You had the benefit, we'll say, of when you were starting this role, you knew what the, your boss, the mayor, expected of you, and that was clear from the beginning. But for many people are talking, that are listening right now, they're like, that's great. Thanks, Alex, but I'm in a job already. How should they approach their leader if they don't have that rapport already or that clear understanding of their true purpose? Any recommendations on how to approach that leader? I can use the word humble a couple of times. This I think that's a great way of doing it. But any any suggestions or, or tips on how to do that? So there's a few ways that you can approach this. And I recognize that not everyone has a, a supervisor or a leader that they can go to and they feel like they can have that type of conversation. I think there's other ways that you can still get that information. So one, particularly if you're an HR business partner, so having a relationship with your clients, a partnership relationship with your clients and hearing from them in terms of what their business needs are and what's important to them, I think can give you some lot of sight in terms of how you can add value, what your purpose is in that role. Uh, the secondary piece is, of course, having mentors within the organization. So people who are particularly at the more senior level that are hearing what some of the, the senior leadership team conversations are, they can also can help give you some insight into what's happening. And then third, I would say industry knowledge. So particularly when you're in certain industries, there's certain key themes of what's going on within the industry, whether it's regulation changes or uh, certain factors that, that are impacting the supply chain, et cetera. You can learn more about those things and they really think through how your role connects to that and what are some things that you could put in place to try to help. And at the end of the day, you want to understand how, what are some of the biggest challenges happening within the organization and how your team or your role can bring value in solving that problem. If you can answer those two questions, what are the challenges, and then how your role can help bring value to that, you're on your way there. And, and as I mentioned, there are a number of different sources on how you can get, get to that information. That was so wonderful. I, I love that. Thanks for that, for letting me jump in there with a the follow-up because I thought that was an opportunity to do something very practical. You know, everybody listening right now is hopefully taking a couple notes on, okay, well, this is where I need to go next or this is who I need to talk to or 
maybe they don't have that leader they can talk to directly, but they have other sources of information they can pull from to be able to create that picture of what their purpose really is. All the data point to the fact that all of us want purpose in our work. And it's really easy for us to say, how do we help our employees feel that? But we need to point that lens at ourselves occasionally say, hey, do I really know what that purpose is? Because if you don't, it's easier to get burned out. It's harder to focus. It's harder to be effective as the leader that we all want to be. Absolutely. And I would say that purpose really helps, especially in those moments when you are fatigued mm-hmm. and you are tired. It is that, that, that one notion that really helps get you over the wall. I can tell you personally, I'm a working mom, with two children. I'm recently divorced and managing as a single mother with two children during the pandemic was very difficult and it's all. And there were days when I was tired and, and really what I could think about is, okay, this work, this policy, this, whatever I'm working on, it's going to make a difference so that uh, we can attract or retain police officers who will help make sure that people are safe during this time. Or it's going to, by, by working on this issue, it's going to position us so that we can correct an issue that we've had in our organization for decades. And that will help us in being able to retain talent in the future. Understanding those things, you know, and being able to really recall those type of, I think, important nuggets of, of how your world connected driving the organization, it does. It makes a difference, especially when you're exhausted. Excellent. For anybody out there that may ha- occasionally get exhausted in HR, which is probably you know, once a week, once a day, depending on the, what you're doing right now. <laughs> great, great advice. So if someone has, or wants to connect with you, wants to follow up with you, wants to just learn more about the work that you're doing and, and just be aware of the, the pr- pr- progress you're making and the impact you're making, what's the best way for someone to follow or connect with you? So I'm on LinkedIn and you can look me up Alex Smith on LinkedIn. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook as Alex Smith. And you can certainly follow me there. And you can also uh, follow my tag as here at CHRO Alex. Right. CHRO Alex. You got it first and you take it. That, that's your real estate, right? You, you can own that one. All right. Thank you so much. This has been, I've, I've smiled and laughed a lot, but I've also learned so much stuff from you. It's been an incredible conversation. Thank you for taking some time to join us and for sharing your insights with the audience. I know they all appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Everybody else out there, hope you enjoyed. We were on the human day. Go out there, make sure you know what your purpose is and we'll catch you again next time. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I'm honored to have you as a listener. If you enjoyed this episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, if you know a friend that could benefit from today's conversation, please pass it their way. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. To see show notes, sponsor information, and our full show archives, visit OnlyHumanShow.com.